It's uh, a real pleasure to welcome Caroline again after last week's very successful uh, session on Bulgaria. We're now going to a much smaller and I think uh, much lesser known uh, wine country, Moldova, which I know nothing about. So I'm looking very much forward to learning about this, um, which obviously means I haven't uh, read her book which uh, covers Moldova and has just won an award from uh, in Moldova, which is brilliant. So congratulations on that, Carolyn. And over to you to tell us all about Moldova. Okay, thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Let me just get my uh, screen up. So smaller country, yes. Bigger country in wine terms, perhaps, that perhaps, um, you know, Part of what I want to do when I'm talking about doing these talks is actually to spread the word because this is a country I feel very passionate about and you know want people to know more about this country. So um, obviously I was particularly gratified to get this Medal of Gratitude and Diploma from Wines of Moldova a couple of weeks ago because I think it's quite special when you're writing about somebody's country if they feel that you have done it justice. So, so thank you to the guys from Wines of Moldova. So always useful to start with a map to give some context as to where we are. So as you can see, this little purple area of Moldova surrounded by Ukraine um, to three quarters of the country and then Romania on its western border in the River Prut. Uh, running down that border and then joining the Danube eventually. So Moldova has a tiny, tiny little coastline on the Danube of a few hundred, uh, few hundred feet, literally. Um, so landlocked country, quite continental. Um, so let's go a little bit closer in. So okay, these are the three uh, PGI, protected geographical indications for wine in Moldova. Uh, Kodru in the centre, Stefan Voda down to um, the southeast, and then Trajan's Wall or Valului Trajan down in the southwest corner. Now, Moldova, you know, it's pretty much a landlocked country, so the climate does tend to be quite, quite strongly continental. Um, and it's a very hilly country, but without any high mountains, you know, the highest point in the country is about 400 meters, but an awful lot of the landscape is rolling hills, um, which makes it very good for viticulture. Um, then climatically, Kodru in the center tends to be quite cool. Stefan Voda has a little bit of, of maritime influence. Um, and down in the southwest, Trajan Wall is, is the warmest and driest, and then little corner with the Danube down there. So, um, so there have been three PGIs in Moldova since I think 2014 was the first vintage that they were um, they came into play. Um, and it's all part of part and parcel of the way Moldova's wine industry has been developing and moving towards you know, more quality focused industry and a more sort of European looking industry. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a sec. So one of the things that Moldovans like to claim is that their country is shaped like a bunch of grapes. Um, there are more grapevines per person in Moldova than anywhere else in the world. And this is a country that has been very economically dependent on wine hundreds of thousands of people earning a living from grapes, wine and related industries, obviously like bottling and dry goods and distribution and all the rest of it. I sort of think you have to have had a few glasses of Moldovan wine to see that resemblance. But, you know, the point is that Moldovans really feel that their country and the grapevine are really closely interlinked. One of their great um, legends of the country is about um, in the days of the great leader Stefan Chalmare. Uh, back in the like 15th century or so, um, I ought to know the dates. I'm not good at dates, sorry. Um, but anyway, he was fighting off the Ottoman Turks and his uh, at that time and, and Moldovan soldiers were holed up in the fortress of Soroka and they were starving and the story goes that white storks flew over 
the fortress and dropped bunches of grapes. Um, and that gave the, the defenders some calories, some food and strength to carry on fighting against the Ottoman invaders. So again, the legend of the grapevine and grapes is very much intertwined with Moldovan identity. Um, so a few key facts and statistics. Um, the estimate for the 2020 harvest is, you know, 150,000 to 200,000 tons. Um, Total area and divine is, is quite a lot, but what we're really interested in, in terms of the wine industry, is the area in commercial production for wine, because that's, that's, that's what's, you know, being managed by wineries or bought by wineries or um, for commercial wine, as opposed to Moldovans do drink a lot of homemade wine. Um, there's a lot of hybrids still in people's back gardens. Um, you know, so there's a lot of home production as well. Um, but as far as we're concerned, I think it's it's the commercial production that, that matters. Um, and out of that, you've just got just under 10,000 hectares registered for production of protected geographical indication wines. As of today, there are no protect PDOs at all, but there are plans in place. There are There is progress towards um, a couple of PDOs, but politics have got in the way with <laughs> at least one of them. Mm -hmm. Politics is very large in this part of the world, which again, I can tell you a bit more about. Uh, so just under 200 wineries. Now, just for comparison, also worth pointing out the population size in Moldova is about three and a half million people-ish. One of the Moldovans in the audience can probably confirm exactly what it is today, but Romania on the other side of the River Prut is uh, just over 20 million people. Um, Romania has an area under Vitis vinifera of 90,000 hectares, give, give or take. Um, Moldova, 62,000 hectares um, for a population of sort of three and a half million. So it gives you a context of how this tiny country has such a significant um, area of vines. And this is, you know, this is a big drop from, you know, 20 years ago, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and say so Bulgaria was 280 registered wineries. Romania is quite similar and Moldova has 200 registered wineries. But this number is interesting. The wine sector registered economic entities, you know, 39, just over 39,000 of these. So some of these will be grape growers, some will be bottlers, some will be involved in various aspects of production, but that gives you an idea of quite how many people are involved in this sector. Um, so 2020 has been a really difficult year. Um, obviously, you know, everybody understands how difficult the COVID situation has been, but for Moldova, they also had to deal with um, spring frosts and really severe droughts. So this is about uh, 25 to 40% down on normal. There is also quite a lot of winery uh, wine in stock at the wineries, which is again, an area that's, yeah, potentially quite a significant challenge to the industry. Um, export volumes, this is still a bit of an estimate. Obviously data for the first 12 months, of, uh, six months of 2020 is available, but um, you know, export volume is pretty close to, or possibly slightly more than the country is actually going to produce this year. Major export partners, Romania, um, actually in bottled wine, it goes Romania, Poland. No, it goes, Rum <laughs> I wrote this down earlier. Hang on, just to get it in order. Romania, Czech Republic, Poland, Russia, China, Ukraine are the top markets for bottled wine from Moldova. And for bulk wine from Moldova, which accounts for about set eight, 70% uh, or so of the actual volume of exports. And that goes to Belarus, Georgia. That's an interesting one, that a lot of Moldovan wine is going to Georgia. Um, Romania, Russia, and then the UK appears there. 
because some of you may or may not have noticed that brands like iHeart now quite often the white wines, particularly the Sauvignon or the Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio, uh, will be mulled over if you look at the bottle. So there is stuff coming over to be to be bottled in the UK as well. Um, so wine sector share of GDP is 3%, but, you know, back in 2005, when I first went to Moldova, it was 9%, if I remember correctly, and it was 25% of all the country's export earnings. It was the biggest export earner after um, expat people. That's, yeah, 9% contribution to GDP in 2005. Um, and it was 28% of exports at that time. So it has dropped quite a lot, but it's still significant um, money. Uh, so let's have a look at then some of the important grape varieties that Moldova grows. Um, for various complex reasons over the years, um, things like you know, Russians bringing in French experts at one time, phylloxera, of course, and, and so on. International grape varieties are the majority of plantings. Now, these figures come from the work in progress wine uh, vineyard register, of which about 30 something thousand bit hectares have been registered out of those 62,000 I mentioned. So these are not complete figures for the country. These are only for wineries that have actually done their bit and registered what they have in the vineyards or the bigger growers that are. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this changes once the register is complete. But one thing you might notice looking at these numbers is that you know, they're Western European grape varieties for the most part. A few Caucasian ones, Ricazzitelli has, has been quite important. And then another one that I would draw to your attention is Saparavi, um, obviously a Georgian grape variety, but spread, has spread out quite heavily across the, uh, the Russian empire and the Soviet Union. And a grape that does really well in Moldovan conditions. I really like what Saparavi does in Moldova. And I haven't yet got to the bottom of whether it's the growing conditions or whether it's the clones that Moldova has ended up with. What you will notice from this, though, is a lack of local grape varieties. Um, and they are still currently, they're growing, but they're still only about uh, 1400 hectares. Um, so these are some of the local grape varieties that I think are potentially of interest in terms of quality and um, you know, consumer appeal and so on and so on. So among the reds, um, the one that probably has the most attention as a potential flagship is Rara Niagara, which is grown um, over the border in Romania too, as Verbesca Negra, the black old woman's grape. Um, then there's the black maiden grape, Fatasca Negra, which probably originates from somewhere in what used to be the Principality of Moldavia. Now that got divided after 1812, when what is Moldova today became the Russian province of Bessarabia and the western part of it ended up in Romania and is now the Moldovan hills. So Fatasca Niagara, as far as anybody knows, comes from somewhere in that corner, whether it, you know, political borders, country borders and so on have obviously moved with, with history. And it seems to be a very old grape. Nothing is known about its parentage. Um, same with Rara Niagara, nothing known about parentage. So definitely local to this region, somewhere between Romania and the Republic of Moldova. Um, and then there've been, you know, in the previous era, there was a lot of pressure because Moldova was a really big, or the Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic was a really, really big supplier of wine into the Soviet Union. I think it was worth it accounted for about a quarter of all the Soviet Union's wines at one point. 
And one of the things that happened quite a lot in that era was people producing various crosses to, you know, a friend in Bulgaria said to me that basically it was a good way of getting your doctorate was to produce a new grape variety that looked as though it had merit. So lots of experiments in that kind of thing. So hence, you know, this Codrin she, which I think I might have tasted once, but it's I'm looking forward to exploring that a bit more because it could be interesting. Um, so, yeah, of these two reds, Rara Niagara is... <laughs> I think it's a grape that actually has quite a lot of potential in a kind of lighter, more elegant style. It doesn't have big body. It has quite light tannins, can have problems with even having enough color. Um, so it can be quite challenging to work with, but I think certainly for us, we markets that love Pinot Noir and we love Kek Brancoche and Blau Frankish and Gamay and things like that. You know, I think this is a grape that has a lot to offer. Uh, Fatasca Niagara grown a lot both in Romania and Moldova so again a lot of people seeing that as potentially actually the red flagship. Um, then on the whites a um, couple of these are uniquely Moldovan so Viarica which is a cross from 1969 this was um, so there are a number of not non not pure vinifera crosses. So obviously Sabel is a hybrid. And then when we come down to Alda on its Khan, again, there is some hybrid genetics in there. Um, and this was in an era when they were also looking for productivity, when they were looking for things like frost resistance and disease resistance. And actually with kind of moves towards sustainability in the wine industry. And it's something that Moldova is looking at very seriously. I think that some of these resistant grape varieties are going to become more and more interesting. Um, as you can see, so Viarica, Alda on its Khan and Riton, all three of those are crosses, hybrids, um, but capable of producing quality wine. You know, there's some really lovely stuff being produced from Viarica at the moment. It's quite aromatic, quite perfumed, and that comes from the Aliatico parentage, but also nice crisp acidity. Um, so that's kind of growing interest. Alda on its Khan again was really grown as a grape for cold resistance and for distillation, but turning out to actually make some interesting wines. Um, there's a winery called Novak who, who bought it really because he couldn't get what he wanted. The nursery had run out of vines, so he said he, he would give this a go. And it's turned out actually to make some really interesting wines with really nice acidity. And he's where, um, and then Riton as well, the Gewurztraminer gives it some, uh, nobody knows when that was produced, but you know, it has really nice grapey floral uh, character to it. Um, and then the two Fatascas, Fatasca Alba and Fatasca Regala. Again, Fatasca Alba, nothing known about its parentage, probably originated in Moldavia, Moldovan Hills, Republic of, um, sometime in the ancient past. Very capable of making nice, elegant wines. It's quite an understated grape variety, um, but you know, there's some really nice stuff being produced now, um, both sides of the border. Fatasca Regala, definitely a Romanian grape um, from Transylvania in like 1920. Um, and it's a descendant of Fatasca Alba. So there's a real local connection though. Fatasca Regala is a bit more substantial. There are phenolics in the pulp. So you tend to have a, a more structured, wine that you can do maybe a little bit more with barrel fermentation and that kind of thing as well so it's perhaps a little bit more versatile than Patasca Alba but all you know interesting grapes that are specific to the region um, and then I thought you know one of the things that uh, Moldova has been doing quite a lot of in the last few years is working hard on developing tourism and wine is a very important part of the national strategy because it's so many people rely on it um, and tourism and tourism you know they'd love to encourage it and wine is obviously part of that because it's a really flagship product for Moldova you know because it it talks about, it tells the story of the soil and the place you know you can uh, only grow grapevines in the in the right soils in the right environment so you know the the cross here at 
old ore hay is is very iconic for, for the country. Um, and there's a fantastic cave monastery that still has a priest in it that you can go and visit. And there's an old um, preserved Moldovan village. So you can go and visit, see these, these traditional cottages for Moldova and you can go and eat traditional food in the restaurant in the town and you can have lessons on how to make traditional dishes and all sorts of things. So it's, it's a fun place to go and visit if you're in Moldova. Um, and everything's painted this sort of blue or green turquoise color, you know, the color of grass or the sky. Um, so it's very, it can be very sweet. Um, and some of it's, you know, certainly when I first went to Moldova in 2006, I was quite shocked. Um, so these are some of the pictures I took then. So I went to go and work on a project which was um, funded by USAID because one of the things that they'd identified at that point was Moldova was like the poorest country in Europe and so they wanted to support industries that might help people in Moldova to earn more money and to bring them up to western standards and wine being so economically important in Moldova was one of the products that was identified um, so I went out there on this project with the idea of looking at the wineries and seeing where the opportunities were and which ones might be ready to, to start on a programme of improving what they were doing. And I very naively thought that I would see a mini Romania, but I didn't. I saw a country that was, you know, I turned up in the coldest winter for decades and people were fishing through ice holes in the lake, in the park, in the middle of the capital city. And snow was, um, you know, because uh, that was how you got in something to eat, was to go and cut a hole in the ice in the, in the middle of the city. Um, and at this point, Moldova was basically exporting 99% of its wines. And most of that, 85% or so, was going to Russia and the rest was pretty much going to other CIS countries like Ukraine, Belarus, and so on. So quality didn't really matter at that point. You know, pipes left on the ground, pools of wine, rusty tanks, you know, it was, and I thought I'd seen some fairly grotty wineries in the south of France at that point, having been trawling around cooperatives, putting together, um, French, you know, my French table wine blend, but this was another level of shock really for me at that time. Um, and again, another site here and just above the top of the, the trucks here that you can maybe see a pipe going from the conifer across to this other tree here. These are glass pipes and it's quite typical for these huge winery sites because they were big. Um, still are big winery sites because volume was what mattered at that time and these glass pipes and you're going well why glass pipes and one winemaker said to me you know well you can see what's in them you know light stripe was not something that had occurred to people at that point because what the Soviet market the former Soviet market wanted really was about quantity and it was usually semi-sweet and it was mostly bottled in Moldova, but if it was bottled in a nice blingy bottle and priced right, they could more or less sell what they liked and they relied on pasteurization to keep it stable. Um, so, you know, at that point, no truck with cold sterile filtration or hygiene or anything much really. And you could guarantee that the worse the wine was, the more reluctant they would be to give you a spittoon. Um, but yeah, so, so it was quite an eye opening trip, but it was also so and it was while I was in Moldova in 2006 working on this project that the first Russian ban came in. And again, this was a horrible shock to Moldova because it had been so economically dependent on sen sen selling wine to Russia and the whole lot came to a stop just like that. Um, there were claims of um contamination with pesticides which were never proven and it all seemed to be a political matter to do with changing border regulations with the ukraine but you can imagine i mean it was 250 million dollars equivalent of losses over the next couple of years 
and people starving. You know, they weren't earning much money anyway. Um, people living on handouts from, from family going and working abroad. It was disastrous. But what it did do was kickstart the Moldovan industry into realizing that relying on Russia was a problem because there were, there's no other market in the world that could take that wine that they were producing. So it was a time, you know, it was a problem waiting to happen, but the cruelty of the Russian ban kind of kicked, forced and kickstarted a change. So these are two pictures I took at a winery called Salkutsa. The picture on the right with the enamel tanks is from 2006 and the picture on the left is from a recent visit in 2018 so and I think that just highlights to me the absolutely dramatic change that has happened in Moldova and it's been driven by the wineries and by people in the industry supported yes by aid USAID um, there's been Dutch support there's been German support there's been Swedish support there's been UK support all gone into helping this poor country bring its wine industry up to modern standards and you can see it's you know it's there modern standards are in place um, and the other thing about Salkutsu was it was one of the first wineries that I went to that understood that really it actually had to own its own vineyards Moldova privatized its vineyards and its wineries differently to Romania and Bulgaria, if you were listening last time. Um, but it ended up with very fragmented vineyard holdings. Um, and it wasn't until I think 1998 it even started to be solved. But fragmented vineyard holdings and lack of professional viticulture meant that fruit quality was not always ideal. So, and I think Salkutsa were one of the first to actually start planting their own vineyards on this sort of scale so that they could manage um, the quality of fruit that they were getting. Um, now, I think most of the big wineries understand about managing fruit quality, be it through owning vineyards of their own or be it through managing them under long-term contracts. Um, but it's been an interesting, an interesting journey. Anyway, yes, just to tell you another little story. So this winery, Agrovin Bulbaca, actually became, so it was originally founded in 1893 by a chap called Constantine um, uh, Mimi, who was the last governor of Bessarabia and who had studied in Montpellier and come back to Moldova, um, or Bessarabia as it would have been, and set up a winery and he brought aligote to the region as well because he loved aligote as a grape but of course it became a soviet era era collectivized farm and this particular one became the biggest single supplier of wine in the soviet union i was told or with all these horizontal tanks set up in the courtyard and you know uh, this is a worker bus and you know glass pipes all over the place um, so it must have been quite an amazing sight to see, really, I think. But um, and then this, you can see the, the rent, some a couple of pictures from the renovation that uh, Christina Froloff sent to me to show me the extent of what they'd have to overcome. You know, these rusting Soviet horizontal tanks and then, you know, this wrecked building. Um, and then that's what it looks like today. You know, I mean, it's absolutely jaw droppingly dramatic and they've developed in there. Obviously, they've modernized the winery and there's a really nice restaurant Use it, cooking local dishes, but in a, a much more modern, more refined way. So definitely, if you ever go to Moldova, this is a, a must visit place because it's, you know, it's dramatic what they've what they've done with it. And it shows you a little bit about the really regal almost regal history not regal's not the right word i suppose but um noble history of wine in this country that was just totally broken in the soviet era and restarted in the new era i say a huge kick up the backside with the first russian ban and there was another russian ban in 2013 as well so um and that was to do with moves towards um, free trade with the European Union. So almost certainly political yet again. Um, 
So just another, um, also this is another winery that's definitely worth visiting. So this is the, the was the kind of the first of the, the quality wineries set up in 1827 um, at Pukar. And this is uh, far down in the South East corner in uh, Stef um, Stefan Voda region. And this is what it looks like today. So again, you know, kind of one of the best, one of the most successful wineries, I would say, both in terms of quality and in probably in terms of sort of export of premium bottled wines as well. Because one of the things that they revived was a wine called Negru de Pocar, which was a blend of with Rara Negra, Saparave and Cabernet Sauvignon and some oak aging and it was, it's perhaps Moldova's most famous wine. So this winery revived it in 2003 when they took over and renovated the winery under new ownership. And a really, you know, famously Negri de Pocar was the only wine exported in Soviet times with an English label because it was famously exported to the Queen of England. Um, but anyway, Negri de Pocar today is, yeah, I mean, it it's, can be an absolutely fantastic wine. We gave it a gold medal at Decanter for the 2015 vintage, and it, it deserves it, you know, it, um, real flagship for Moldova. And again, this is another wine, winery that's worth a visit because there's a nice restaurant. There are some rooms, you know, some beautiful views over the vineyards because their vineyards are very close to, to the winery. And they're right on the border with Transnistria and Ukraine here. So you can see three countries standing in the vineyards. Um, they've also been quite pioneers, I think, in putting Rara Niagara back on the map as a single variety because they grew it to go into the blend. And then they started making some rosé with it. And then they actually started making some varietal wine too. So then this picture leads me on to another um, thought about wineries in Moldova, and that is very many of them are family owned. There's not that much foreign investment, which has its pros and cons. Obviously, foreign investment brings in money, but because they tend to be family owned, the owners are very close to the industry and they tend to be winemakers uh, themselves. Um, Lilia and Juliana here is a uh, is a winemaker, Lilia is the CEO. Um, Mum was the winemaker, dad used to sell wine. Now he manages getting people to actually come and work in the vineyards. But this is a story quite often that you see in Moldova, both for the, for the big wineries and for the small wineries, um, that there's a real family connection. So this is Gitana's vineyard and this sort of scene of rolling hills uh, with gentle slopes. So it tends to be quite rich soil, but there's a carbonate uh, limestone bedrock underneath it. So, um, and down in the south of the country, you know, it's quite easy. I think they are certified organic for their vineyards. And if not, if they're not certified, they're, they're working on it because it's quite a dry climate, very well drained, not much rainfall in the summer. So it makes sense for this, this area to be moving towards sustainability and it is very much part of the strategy going forward. Okay, another family winery, Fautor, mum and daughter, uh, Tatiana and Roxanda. Tatiana is involved in the winemaking, Roxanda does the marketing. And so this was actually at the cave monastery at Old Orhe as well. Um, and again, the same story about the rolling hills, the nice sunlight, air drainage, um, and you know, modern winery as you might expect to see anywhere, really. Um, Chateau Vartelli, I'll mention because they do have some wines in the UK at the Wine Society, and they were really the first of the new era of private wineries. In I think it was 2004 they were founded, so it was still a very new winery in 2006 when I first went there. Um, and this is some of their vineyards in the south. So they didn't have, basically didn't have vineyards when the winery was founded, but this was uh, sort of last winter. And again, you can see the sort of rolling open hills, but you can also see that continental climate that, is, you know, snowy landscape in the winter is quite, um, is quite typical. So um, 
And what I haven't really put any slides in of, and I should have done, is because one of the things that has changed in Moldova very significantly is partly thinking about quality, partly thinking about working towards European Union standards so that they can make most of that free trade agreement, partly um, and partly the development of small wineries has been a really critical step. So it used to be that it was pretty much impossible to have a small winery because um, a small professional winery as opposed to being a homemade wine producer. Uh, because the burden of bureaucracy was ridiculous, 150,000 pages of regulations, many of which were contradictory. You know, every single wine had to have its own set of technical instructions, which cost the equivalent of 900 euros per wine. Now, bear in mind that probably at that time, you know, 150 euros a month was a good wage. You know? So 900 euros per wine was, was a ridiculous burden. So one of the things that changed by 2011 was actually the legislative framework that allowed small wineries to evolve. So it started off with a small group of about eight, and now there are 42. Um, and I think it's in the small wineries that you know, winemaker, you get the personal vision, you get people pushing the boundaries, you get people trying, you know, the first orange wines and the first natural wines have tended to come from small wineries. And then some of the bigger wineries have said, hmm, OK, we need to explore this, too. So, you know, it's I think it's really important that a country has both. And the other thing that I want to mention about Moldova and praise them for, really, is because you know, other countries I write about and talk about in Eastern Europe find it really difficult to work together. They find it's too much like the previous era of collectivization. Um, so getting people to work together as a group, as a generic body, um, you know, it just feels like it's alien to what they want now in their independent world. But what Moldova has done, have been very good at doing, is presenting a united face. So there's an organization called Wine of Moldova, um, and they go to wine fairs, they go to Provine, they go to, you know, whatever, together. Big wineries and small wineries, because they have understood that they're a small country in a big wine world, and presenting a united front is really the only way forward for them. So they may argue behind the scenes, but they do put on a great show of being together um, when it counts um, and supporting each other and recognizing that they need each other, you know, um, which is really good to see. Um, obviously for people that are here in the UK, there are one or two places you can buy some Moldovan wines, um, specialist moldovanwine.co.uk is a couple of sisters um, and one of their husbands who bring in some, um, a few wineries. Transylvaniawine.co.uk has got Pukar and Bostovan, which are uh, part of the same cellar. The Wine Society has um, some wines from Chateau Vartelli and Lathwaite's have had long relationships in Moldova as well. They've been buying wines from a particular winery um, that used to be called Acarex and um, now sells some of its wines under the G and Radicini. Anyway, so that Lathwaite's have been working in Moldova for about 15 years, sort of sending in their winemaker and, and working in partnership. So they're also a good place to explore. And then if anybody wants to read any more about the politics and the background and how Moldova differed from its neighbours in Eastern Europe, um, I do have a discount code available for the next few days. So send me a message if you're interested. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen now and see if anybody's got any questions for me, because as you can see, there is an awful lot of things I could talk to you about about Moldova. So it'd be good to hear if anybody's got any specific questions that I, I do. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Karen. Um, I was intrigued that half the vineyards are still in private hands. And um, I am, and you know, you mentioned that a lot of them would have been planted with hybrids and 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 so on. 
But I wondered about how they control that in terms of disease and the risk of something like um, grapevine yellows or um, uh, flavescence doré in French, um, sort of spreading from un completely uncontrolled uh, and perhaps often not properly maintained private vineyards to the larger commercial vineyards? Yeah, I think that probably isn't a question that has been tackled so far, because as far as I know, it isn't there yet. And it would have to get there, you know, it would have to progress across Europe uh, with, you know, the leaf hoppers and, and so on. And it would, the leaf hoppers would have to be able to survive Moldova's really cold winters. Um, but yes, I mean, one of the things about obviously a lot of the garden plots being hybrids is they're quite disease resistant, which is part of the reason why they uh, people continue to grow them is actually they don't need a lot of treatment and they're quite disease resistant. So that doesn't, as far as I can tell, seem to be a problem. But no, that's yes. uh, I would have to ask some of the locals if it's something they've started to worry about or taking action about, really. OK, yeah, yeah. thanks. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, you talked quite a lot about the, the, the family at the end, the family wineries, but um, you didn't quite explain where they got their money from because now they've obviously put, they put a lot of money into the vineyards and the winery, but where's the money actually come from for these sort of small private? Um, yeah, well, it was actually in the sort of pri um, previous era, you know, up till the Russian ban, you know, up till 2005. It was actually quite easy to make a lot of money as uh, selling wine in Moldova. So they actually got quite wealthy selling large amounts of wine to, to Russia. So, um, so that's where quite a lot of it came from, just basic. And the wineries were, were worth pretty much nothing. So they weren't expensive to buy and to take over. Um, so, but yeah, you could make, that was one of the things that attracted people at families to into the wine industry if, um, was that they could make a lot of money. So the money is actually mainly been made in wine, not in other industries. Yeah, no, I mean, it varies. You know, you could just about every winery has its own story. But yes, there's quite a lot of money actually was made in wine. Um, there are other other some wineries where money will have been made in other aspects of agriculture. Agriculture is the big industry in Moldova because they don't have oil, they don't have minerals. So really it's, it's agriculture and quarrying are the, are the main industries and exporting their people. So yeah, but yeah, you know, each winery has its own story about where the money comes from. I mean, there are a few wineries that are owned by say, you know, one or two have Russian ownership, for instance. Um, so at least one Pukar now is is listed on the Budapest um, uh, Bucharest sorry stock exchange. So obviously there will have been an injection of money from from there, and they have some private equity investment too. So you know each winery has kind of a different story, but there is quite a lot of money was actually made in wine to be invested in wine. <laughs> Thank you. Can I just ask quickly um, the alb the the white cross alb. De, de oh, yeah. um, you said there was a winery that had planted this and they were doing really well which winery was that yeah it's called Novak so it's a small um I don't think anybody imports it as yet N-O-V-A-K um but yeah he's that that winemaker's making some really interesting things cracking saparavi from 40 year old vines <laughs> yeah thank you and also I'd like to say that um I've, I've read um, Caroline's book and I thought it was absolutely brilliant so you must buy it okay thank you <laughs> yes you wrote a really nice review thank you Rosemary uh, but, but uh, yeah very good uh yes yes walnuts every bit of Moldova all the rows are lined with walnut trees um so yes more, walnuts is a very big product for Moldovans and fresh walnuts um they also grow a lot of uh, plums for prunes but the fresh vegetables in Moldova are great. Um, you know, I really love every meal starts with a fresh salad, lots of peppers and tomatoes and herbs and cucumbers, lots of aubergines and, you know, so, hmm. yeah, 
and some you know, Moldovan lodger and lots of produce back. And actually one of the reasons I think that Romania has uh, now imports so much Moldovan wine is Romanians see Moldova as kind of brothers in arms, you know, um, and several people in Romania said, oh yeah, yeah, Moldova is, you know, the, the food is great there, the vegetables are so good, and I think that reputation also extends into the wine. Um, so there's a lot of Moldovan wine now, especially bottled stuff, goes to Romania because, you know, um, shared values and so on and so on. Hmm. Caroline, you touched briefly on organic strict sustainability, but I think that was just for one small cor corner of the country. Can you say a little bit about um, viticultural practices um, and general approach to things green in Moldova? Yes, I mean, I think there was a time, obviously, in the Soviet era when, um, you know, modern pesticides and fungicides and tractors and so on were all part of the way the industry worked. But um, then, you know, after privatisation and restitution and so frankly, people were too poor to start to buy agrochemicals. Um, but... Um, it is part of the industry strategy going forward to, to develop sustainability. It's very much a key focus um, because, you know, some wineries have already shown that it's, it's possible. Um, and though one of them, Kostya Stratan from Equinox was saying that the headache, he's been one of Moldova's few organic producers for a long time. And he said the headache is getting the certification because again, it's, it's complicated, but I think that the industry is getting behind the need to be sustainable. Um, and it's just, you know, Greg, training the industry to be aware of a new way of thinking. And some producers, I think, maybe need more persuading than others. I think some are already on board, um, but there's a kind of education job to encourage people to understand that actually it's, it has to be the way forward for Moldova. It has to be the way forward for the wine industry really, but it's, and it's a good tool. I suppose it, it works both ways. You know, it's, people have to be educated as to how to manage things sustainably. So there's a lot of work going in from um, wine of Moldova and so on to provide, you know, wine, wine making consultancy. And as part of that, you know, viticultural consultancy to, to help build that sustainability message. Yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you. Great varieties for orange wine production, I have been asked. I mean, there are relatively few orange wines at the moment. I think Equinox makes his out of a blend. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head what. I believe that Pukar have just introduced a, or have produced this year, their first orange wine from Viarica. So I have to persuade somebody to send me a sample at some point so I can actually taste it. Um, I mean, I would imagine that Riccazzitelli would be an obvious one for people to work with, but say I can only think of two or three orange wines at the moment. Part of the trouble for Moldova, I think, about sort of going the, the natural wine kind of route is that actually it's rather too close to homemade wine. <laughs> um, but yes, um, so question about premiumization domestically and export markets. Yes, I mean, the export numbers for the first six months of this year, in spite of COVID, actually bottled wine increased by 5.4% in volume and also slightly in value. Um, and the fact that it's increasing in value in spite of the difficult conditions is a good sign. Uh, unfortunately for Moldova, you know, I said 70% of its wine is still being sold as bulk wine and at one of the lowest prices in Europe of just under a euro a litre. Um, but there's quite a lot of work been going into, especially for the small wineries, the new small wineries, uh, pre uh, building premium products, so building better quality and asking higher prices. One of the problems for Moldova that it has that is different to Romania and Bulgaria is that because it's so poor, the minimum wage now is the equivalent of 96 euros a month. 
so and the average wage and that includes you know high paid jobs in the city is 330 euros a month so you can imagine the market for bottled wine domestically is quite small uh, it may only be a hundred thousand people um, but it's really buzzing in Kishnau. you know there are wine bars and restaurants and so on that are really supporting the local wine industry and the small wineries and the more premium price products but as um, somebody I own Luca who's chair of the small wineries association says basically you know export is obligatory however small you are you have to export your wines you know the the low even for somebody like him who's quite well established as a small winery he can only sell 30 percent of his wines in moldova because the market's too small and he has his own wine bar to, and shop to sell them as well um so yeah and it's always a challenge you know to find a niche um and to build a reputation for better quality in moldova and that's you know so much work has gone into this and it's it's coming but it's still slow you know um still slow um i don't know whether they're doing much work with uh ricazzatelli particularly quite a lot of it will go into into brandy or divin as they call their pgi brandy in moldova um <clears throat> so i've not seen many people certainly in my my experience really focusing on it as a premium wine to be honest uh sweet sparkling or sweet wines yes there are some uh, as everywhere sparkling wines are booming um so the state-owned winery crickover probably has the longest history in sparkling wines you know it's it, um, Moldova is famous for having these two enormous cellars at crickover and at molesti Mij. Um, Milesti Mij has the Guinness Book of Records for a record for the biggest collection of wine in the world. Uh, but both of them have just tens of kilometers of even hundreds of kilometers of underground tunnels where um, you can actually drive through the tunnels and do wine tastings down there and so on. But Krikova started making sparkling wine back in the 1950s and has, you know, they do make some good quality bottle fermented sparkling. And the job of riddling the bottles is handled, handed down from mother to daughter um, and is, you know, it's apparently it's quite strongly protected and kept in the family. If that's the job you do, it's kept in your family. Um, and then, um, but yeah, there are some new ones have appeared as well from people like Pukar, um, particularly. Um, just trying to think how many others, but yeah, there is some, say, some, uh, and then sweet wine. Um, that kind of came back. There's this chap called Constantine Stratan, who was kind of the pioneer of the new era of sweet wine in Moldova back in the mid 2000s. Um, and he started to make ice wine and um, botrytis wine as well, particularly with Riesling. There's actually quite a lot of Rhine, Re and this is Rhine Riesling, not Italian Riesling. Um, so there's several producers making some really cracking good ice wines. Can't guarantee you're going to get botrytis every year, but in Moldova, you can pretty much guarantee it's going to freeze. So more ice wine than botrytis. So Riesling bit of muscat as well, some nice muscat otanel ice wine too. So, um, right, yeah, that's a complicated, C corruption and Kotnar, so yes, not really. Yeah, Cal Caroline, can I ask, um, the two things are unrelated, but first of all, you mentioned, you know, politics and the situation mm. is complicated. Uh, you haven't mentioned um, the F word fraud and corruption. Is, is this a problem in Moldova? And is it hampering the wine industry? Does it hold it back? And, and then my question about Kotnari, I know Kotnari is mostly in Romania, but I think historically it was in Moldova and maybe part of it still is, I don't know. Um, but, and I know that there's the private winery in Romania that's got Kotnari in its name, um, but is there no way that Moldova could sort of try and reclaim it and use it as a hero brand? No, I don't think so. And to be honest, it doesn't work for Romania either. So if we start with the Kotnar story, so the whole region of it, it is a DOC region, Kotnar. Um, so the former state winery, um, 
has Cotnar in its name, SC Cotnar. And then there's another winery, Cotnari Wine House, which has been set up by the children of the owners of the former state winery. But they are very, very protective of Cotnar as a region and other you know, there are one or two other wineries in, in Romania have tried to set up wineries and produce wine there. And um, it usually ends up in the courts. So, um, and it's just, I mean, I wrote about it in my book, actually compared Kotnar to Tokai and the way two famous regions for sweet wines have gone in completely different directions. And Tokai does work as a marketing hook for Hungary. Kotnar really doesn't work as a marketing hook for Romania for various reasons. Um, but it is, you know, it's in the region of the Moldovan hills, which would, you know, way back 16th century and earlier will have been the Principality of Moldavia. But no, there is none of Kotnar in Mo the Republic of Moldova. So completely different countries. And I don't think there's anything, you know, and I don't actually think unless you're very clever about it, as to some extent they have been in Tokai. In today's wine industry, I don't think sweet wines work as as the hook um, to, to when you want to build a wine industry about quality dry wines. Um, so. Yes, there is a long history of making sweet wine. They still make something that is actually called pastoral now, but used to be called cago or cajo, um, which is sort of 16% fortified sweet red wine. Um, but they had to give up um, cago or cajo as part of the agreement with for free trade with the EU. Um, so, and this dates back to the, the days of, you know, connections with French winemakers and so on. So there is a history of it. There is some good sweet wine in, in terms of fortified reds in Moldova. But so the corruption thing, um, I'm going to tread quite carefully here, but there was, I think it hampers the whole of Moldova. So I told the story again in my book of, um, gosh, it must be three or four years ago now, where corruption managed to lose Moldova about 10% of its GDP an awful lot of money managed to disappear in a series of dodgy bank loans. And, you know, even made Radio 4, it was such a scandal, but I don't think as far as I know that money has ever been recovered or anybody has been brought to book about it. So, you know, it's something that affects the whole of Moldova. I wouldn't like to necessarily single out the, anybody in the wine industry for it, but you no, know, it, it is a real problem. Um, for, you know, for a poor country like this to lose, you know, the equivalent of 10% of its GDP was just unbelievable. But yeah. Anyway. Hmm. Yep. Okay. Something funny happened to my screen there. Can you still see me? Hear me? You can still see. Yes. I don't know. Jochen, we can see your screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> These emails. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I don't see I don't see you Caroline. Okay, no. Um I don't know how to make myself the main view. Yeah, we'll be <laughs> hang on view options maybe there's a So none of you see Caroline, is that right? No, no, we're still looking we're viewing it. Or we're looking at your screen for some reason. Yeah. Okay. Hang on, I'll do this. There we go. That should be ah, there you are. Hey, Daryl. Hi, Daryl. <laughs> uh, hi, Caroline. <laughs> no, I think that's that was all the questions that were there. I don't know if anybody else has got any further questions. Anything else? <laughs> oh, she's... Yes, so <laughs> oh, look and stop it. <laughs> there you go. Right. Technology. Right. Well, as I, I would encourage people, you know, to ex I feel very passionate about supporting this country because, you know, one of the things that it made me realize, I think when I first went there and that first Russian ban came in and that I've realized as I've worked with this country over the years is, you know, most of the time what I do, you know, wines are nice to have, right? It's not an essential to most of us. It's, um, but in Moldova, it is, you know, it, people's lives and livelihoods um, depend on wine. 
So, you know, so I'm really keen to support the wine industry and to see where they've come from to where they are today. You know, those pictures I showed you from 2006 when it was so challenging to find anything that you wanted to drink to now where there are some fantastic wines. I did a masterclass in Romania last year where I did the top five Moldovan reds versus the top five Romanian reds. And Moldova held its own. You know, probably half the audience said Moldova had the edge and the other half were loyal Romanians, of course. But, you know, the quality of the wine, the best wines is genuinely exciting and interesting and you know I think supporting this very poor very forgotten very downtrodden country and when we can travel again I really would recommend a visit because you know it's a fascinating country to go and see it's so different to what you might expect to see in western Europe and the stories the personal stories and so on and just just amazing and it's going to continue that way I think as well um, marketing agency wines in Moldova is it's part part industry funded and it also has some support from some various aid agencies, particularly um, I say USAID. I think um, mm. uh, we I can't remember who's supporting the current project, but also I think there's British money and Swedish money has been there, Dutch money. So there've been various aid agencies supporting it, but it is very much also. You know, part funded by the industry who are very committed to you mean you mean the wineries um, and well, local governments or is, is part funded by the industry yes mm. um, um do any of them speak english yes most of them do or they can arrange for somebody to speak english they are very used to having to provide translators some of the wineries there language of the wine would be Russian, some would be Moldovan, but they can always find somebody that will speak English for you. So um, Jack Whitehall's travels. Yeah, I thought it was a mixed story for Moldova, really, the Jack Whitehall's travels programme. But at least it put Moldova on the map and showed Krikova. Is there a Philip Cox of Moldova? Um, not really. <laughs> um, so there's a bit foreign investment, um, so a bit of Russian investment, but mostly it's Moldova. And I say there's a bit of, you know, um, say stock market investment in Pukar, but not a lot of Western European sort of investment in the way you see in Romania, for instance. Um, winemakers contributing based on I actually can't remember but I think so edit, editor um, in terms of their levy I must say I haven't gone into on, into the details but uh, yes um, okay any other questions then <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and if not I would encourage people to go out and taste some Moldovan wine <laughs> Um, any successful joint ventures with wineries anywhere else? I, I'm just racking my brains there and I can't think of any off the top of my head. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant, Caroline. That is fascinating. Um, I've learned yeah. so much and I'm sure everyone else has. So um, we're really grateful for you and hopefully there will be lots of people um, asking for the code for the book because we need to read more about it. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone for attending. And we hope we'll see you uh, next week when we're going to Australia.